want to be caffeinated for this one. On this episode of Doing the Most, we're going to talk about the top 10 mistakes you learned how to make from YouTube brewers. Homemade brews and various artists, everything from meat to rose. Big creation, fermentation, and ebriation, doing the most. This is a video that I've been planning to make for a while. I consume quite a bit of YouTube homebrewing content. And for the most part, there are some really incredible YouTube brewers out there doing some cool and innovative stuff and thinking about homebrewing in a lot of new ways, which is super cool and inspires us to think outside the box when we're brewing. However, that said, watching some of these channels, you may clue into some things that don't make sense or are just not best practice. Now, as I've seen these things over the years, I've kind of made notes here and there, and then they kind of fell into a top 10 format. So here we go. Number one, bread yeast. Often YouTube tutorials on how to make wine or mead at home incorporate bread yeast. Typically those little packets of like Fleischmann's bread yeast. Now, granted, Bread yeast will ferment. Bread yeast will convert fermentable sugars into alcohols, but that's not what it's intended to do. Bread yeast is intended to create CO2 bubbles that will help your bread rise. That's its job. Its job isn't to make tasty alcohol. And so using a yeast that is kind of general purpose, made for baking, in something as nuanced as brewing, is just a faux pas. Now, it will work, and if it's what you've got, go ahead and use it. But you're gonna have problems with flocculation, issues with inconsistent alcohol tolerance for that yeast. Some may be able to brew up to 15, 16%. Other packets, you may get six, 7% alcohol. And you may have problems with off flavors. Yeast for brewing have been cultivated for specific flavor profiles, particular different kinds of extraction, like tannin or color extraction. Bread yeast doesn't do those things. Bread yeast makes bread rise. That's what it's for. So if you have access to Amazon or a local homebrew shop or any of the homebrewing equipment sites out there, get good brewing yeast. Number two, underthinking your yeast. Bread yeast in home brewing is underthinking your yeast, but beyond that, sticking to one specific kind of yeast like EC1118, which is incredibly reliable, ferments up to typically very high alcohol tolerance, is not putting a lot of thought into the flavor profile that your yeast can create to complement or add depth to the thing that you're brewing. For example, there are red wine yeasts that are cultivated specifically for color extraction from fruit and to get depth of tannin, and you're just not gonna get that with something like an EC1118. And I understand why YouTube channels will typically use these kinds of yeasts because they are very consistent. I have done this on our channel because I want to make sure that the thing ferments how it's supposed to ferment to be camera friendly. However, you've got more flexibility if you're not trying to produce content for the internet. You can experiment with other kinds of yeasts and search engines are your friend. Run a search query on what you're brewing and for yeast recommendations and see what other people have experimented with. I know winemaking kits come with EC1118. I know EC1118 is a real powerhouse for new brewers because it gives you a consistent clean ferment every time. However, there are other options out there. Don't stick to what you see on YouTube. Number three, flavor extracts. This is a pitfall that I fell into probably in my third or fourth year of brewing. And I can understand why some folks do, and I can definitely understand why other YouTube brewing channels show brewing with flavor extracts. So you may be wondering what I'm talking about. The science of flavor is really complex, and it has to do with a lot of compounds and ketones that create the sensation on the palate of what you're tasting. Like I had a friend who was a PhD student a few years ago, and one of their assignments was to create the ketone that tastes like banana. So they had to figure out the right mix of these food safe additives that created this molecule that tasted like banana. And when they finally nailed it, he said, this tastes like banana runts. Remember banana runts? They were the worst runts. So flavor extracts are kind of the same thing. And you'll see some of them that say that they're a natural flavor extract. And sometimes that means they come from the fruit or herb or spice that, that's listed on the bottle. But sometimes they're just artificial flavorings. 
they're artificial flavorings purporting to be an extract for a thing. Now, my issue with using flavor extracts is it doesn't challenge the home brewer to go outside their comfort zone in using natural ingredients. So say you're making a Merlot and you would like it to be a blackberry Merlot. You could use a blackberry flavor extract and you would have a Merlot that tastes like blackberry. Or you could get blackberries or blackberry juice and use that as the base to ferment your Merlot. Is it more expensive? Yes. Is it gonna help you build your skills as a home brewer? Absolutely. You're gonna learn so much more about process than just dumping an extract into your brew. I will caveat that by saying, Flavor extracts will help you kind of understand what that flavor profile looks like. As an example, I'm doing a birch beer boche right now. And rather than start by boiling all these herbs and putting together this concoction, I just used a birch beer extract because I wanted to see how the birch beer flavor stands up against the caramelized honey. But in the final product and the thing that I would serve to friends and family, I'm not gonna use an extract because the rewarding feeling for me and the more interesting product is gonna come from doing it the most, really using all of the real ingredients to create those flavors. Just be cautious about using extracts in your brewing. Number four, extreme experiments. It's very clear to me why YouTube channels do extreme experiments. We've done a couple here on the channel, including Lucky Charms Meadow Foam Stout, and uh, we did an Oyster Stout Mead. It's weird, kind of wacky stuff, and it's total clickbait, and it engages the viewer because everyone wants to know if that is gonna turn out bad. But I would caution homebrewers not to get too wrapped up in doing wacky experiments with things like wines or meads. I'm a little more flexible when it comes to beer because adjunct brewing is crazy popular right now. But extreme experiments can take the homebrewer away from what it is they are brewing. So like on Reddit's r slash mead sub, there are always wacky experiments going on with various adjuncts. And I can totally understand wanting a beverage that tastes like that. I think it's totally fun to experiment with beverages that have interesting flavors like candy cane, or mint chocolate chip, but you're making a mead, right? And the point of a mead is to ferment honey. And so if the adjuncts, if the flavor profile that you're using is overpowering any of the nuance of your honey, there's kind of no point in making it as a mead other than to say, this is a mead. Honey is a very delicate flavor. And if you're stacking a bunch of Twix bars on top of that, are you really doing any service to the honey? Would it have made more sense to instead use like dextrose or table sugar or something like that? Something with a more neutral fermented profile because honey's expensive. Why obliterate the delicacy of the honey underneath a really heavy flavor profile. Now, am I saying that you should never do wacky experiments? I, I think the world would be boring if nobody went outside the box, but getting caught in that trap of constantly doing wacky stuff, trying to next level every single brew, I think can be a disservice to yourself when sometimes simplicity can be the best option, but clickbait can be fun. Number five, spice and everything nice. In a similar vein, there are a lot of homebrewing channels that love to pitch a ton of herbs and spices into their products. Particularly around the holidays, mold variants of homebrew seem to be very popular. You'll see it all over YouTube starting around Halloween. But there are some things to know about spice. Particularly, there are some palettes, mine included, that perceive fermented spices in vastly different ways than non-fermented spices. For example, cloves and cinnamon can kind of taste soapy to me after they're fermented. And so I prefer to put spices like that in secondary so they don't undergo such an arduous fermentation process. But beyond that, a lot of this YouTube homebrewing content that focuses on heavy spice additions tends to be how-to content catered toward new brewers. And especially with something like a mead where you're dealing with an expensive ingredient and a lot of complexity in how that brewing process can be carried out, like if you're using a nutrient schedule, it is really best practice for the beginner brewer to learn how to do the basics, how to make a good traditional mead before going on and dumping a bunch of spice and 
orange peels and crap like that into your meat. If you've really drilled down and accomplished nailing the basics of a nuanced and delicious mead, then you understand what your blank canvas looks like to start applying other levels of complexity. So while it's trendy to use cardamom or nutmeg or spices, whatever, in homebrewing right now, it's also important to understand the basics of making something drinkable that you would be proud to share. Number six, and this is the one everyone's probably been waiting for, raisins as nutrient. We've all seen this one. And I will preface this by saying that I think raisins to add body are perfectly acceptable. In our blueberry mead video, I added about a pound of raisins to give some body to that mead. That's perfectly acceptable. But the available nitrogen in a raisin is so minute, you would have to add such a quantity of raisins to your homebrew that a one gallon jug would basically be full of raisins. And that's just so you have the available nutrient for the yeast to do their thing. No mind the fact that you basically just made raisin wine at that point. There are a lot of videos out there that will show you putting 25 raisins into your wine to give it some nutrient. There's no nutrient in that. You're adding body or you're adding raisin flavor. That's it. If you want to add nutrient for your homebrew, diammonium phosphate's a great choice up to about 9% alcohol. It's basically like giving your yeast a bunch of candy. However, if you're making a higher potential alcohol content, like a meat or a wine, you're gonna need more available nutrient for the yeast beyond that threshold. That's why a lot of mead makers follow the TASNA schedule of nutrient additions. It's a staggered addition of nutrients and it continues to feed the yeast at a comfortable and paced level all the way through fermentation so there's no yeast stress. You can get stress yeast from dumping in a bunch of diammonium phosphate because they just go wild. They're bouncing off the walls, they're fermenting hard, they're off-gassing a lot of delicate flavors. You're gonna miss out on some complexity and probably get some off flavors if you're just feeding your yeast candy. So that's why there's this big trend toward actually feeding your yeast properly. So there are products like Fermade O, Fermade K, there's the yeast rehydration nutrient GoFirm. There's plenty of options out there and I would encourage you to look up information on nutrient schedules so that you are properly tending to the needs of your yeast. Raisins are not nutrients for home brewing. No matter how many videos are out there trying to do side-by-sides and say, well, I did it with nutrient, I did it with raisins, and the raisins was still better, I didn't notice anything. In the long run, and when you have larger quantities so you can do more A-B testing over time, you will notice a difference. I promise you, you will notice a difference. Use proper nutrient, don't believe the internet, don't put raisins in your homebrew unless you wanna build up the body and give it a little bit of legs. Number seven, mixing measurements. And I will admit now that I am very guilty of this one, but I'm gonna discuss it anyway. Mixing measurements refers to the practice of using metric and imperial or using weight and volume instead of just using a consistent measurement. The reason I say this is because you see it a lot in homebrewing how-to videos. They'll say, use 10 grams of yeast nutrient and one teaspoon of GoFirm. Grams, teaspoons, mixed measurements. If you're developing a recipe, particularly with ingredients that can be inconsistent, like herbs or in my birch beer, there's licorice root. One cup of licorice root today may not be equivalent to one cup of licorice root tomorrow. Look at these things. It's basically just a shredded up root. You're never gonna get the same measurement trying to measure by volume as if you just measured by weight. That's why they put the weight on the package. Four ounces, four ounces of licorice root. It makes so much more sense to create a recipe around weight than any other metric. It's gonna be consistent for you and it's gonna be consistent for anyone trying to follow the recipe later. Mixing measurements is bad and I'm trying to quit. Number eight, not enough fruit. It really kind of surprises me when I see a home brewing how-to on YouTube that's like how to make a strawberry wine. And then they use like, half a pound of fruit in a one gallon batch. At that quantity, in no way is your end result going to taste like strawberries. As a minimum in like a fruit wine, you need three or four pounds of that fruit in order to impart 
some of that fruit's flavor. And I get why this is done. Less fruit makes for a cleaner process. If your channel focuses on one gallon batches, it's hard to work with three to four pounds of fruit in a one gallon batch effectively, unless you have like a two gallon bucket that you can ferment in. And a lot of folks are using one gallon jugs to ferment in. But not using enough fruit is not gonna give you that fruit flavor on the back end. And then when you try it, you're forced to pretend like, oh wow, this tastes like strawberries. When in reality, the strawberry's probably not there. And man, if you give that away to a friend and say, look at this strawberry wine I made, and it tastes like tart white wine with no strawberry flavor, they're not gonna think you're a very good home brewer. So yeah, fruit's expensive, fruit's bulky, it leads to clarification problems and racking problems, but it's also all part of the learning process on how to become a good home brewer. So skimping on your fruit is, is only harming you in the long run as a brewer. And I know you see it on YouTube all the time, a little handful of blueberries going into a batch of beer to make it a blueberry lager, but that's just not real life. That's, that's not gonna impart enough flavor. If you're really trying to make a fruit-based product, go all in on the fruit. And this seems like a good time to plug our peach video that came out last week where we use 30 pounds of peaches to make a peach mead. And I know I said this in a previous video, but going to a wholesale like chef supply store to buy your fruit in bulk in the freezer section is a great way of getting an excess of fruit and kind of minimizing your expense. Number nine, where's that water from? As you've probably seen an hour doing the most videos, we tend to use bottled spring water with added minerals for flavor. We do this because it's a guaranteed source of sterile water and it's also water that tastes good. Now you can go even more next level by treating your water. There's all kinds of information on, on the internet for that. And water treatment is typically used when making beer, but it's definitely a thing people do for wine and meat too. There are often times where I'm watching a home brewing video and I see water going directly from a tap into a carboy. And you have to wonder what the chlorine, fluoride, mineral content is in that water and how those things are going to affect the yeast and the fermentation process itself. I can't remember the last time I used tap water for a homebrew. In fact, there's a, there's a professor at a local university here that is basically a brewing savant. This guy is a genius when it comes to making mead and beer. And for the longest time, he was having trouble with his beers getting infected and trying to figure out what the source was. How, how is this happening? He's following all the best practices. He's, he's doing everything right. He's doing the boil. Everything seems perfect. So apparently he had a, some kind of modified tap on the bathtub in one of his bathrooms and that's where he was getting his brewing water and he deduced through the process of elimination that it was some kind of mold or mildew infection that was in that line that was somehow still getting into the brew whether it was water that had gotten onto his equipment or splashed on him and somehow got somehow this water source was tainted and so when he switched water sources, suddenly this infection problem went away. If it can happen to somebody who is such an expert, who's been brewing for 40 years and won all kinds of awards, it can happen to you. And it can especially happen to you if you learn to do that from a YouTube tutorial. So my recommendation is to use bottled spring water that you get directly from the store, and that way you know it's sterile, but you can also treat your water, boil your water, whatever. Just make sure that you're using sterile, good tasting water to start out with. And number 10, the rush to consume. I think this is probably the thing that I see on YouTube homebrewing videos the most frequently that gives me my own personal chuckle because it kind of goes like this. Two weeks ago, we pitched our yeast into this cider. The cider had a boil with centennial hops as well as being dry hopped with fuggles. We also added nutmeg and cinnamon and cardamom and cloves. Upon our first racking, we added toasted oak and a splash of whiskey. It was basically clear on our second racking, so we bottled it up for today's tasting. Mm. This two week old cider with dozens of adjuncts is the nectar of the gods. I've never made anything this good. I'll never make anything this good ever again. And you should make this right now. Hit that subscribe button for more content just like this. And those are the good actors. You may also see it like this. It's so good. 
There are ways to make something delicious and drinkable in a short period of time. But there are a handful of homebrewing channels out there that are drinking stuff in such rapid succession. There's no way that stuff tastes good. And it will, it probably will taste good eventually, but man, at two or three weeks, it probably doesn't. And it probably just needs time to age and mellow. But there's this rush to put out content and it's a struggle for our channel. We're brewing big stuff in five gallon batches and sometimes it just takes a while. The peach mead video we just put out I had four gigabytes of video dating back to early summer, but we would rather wait to put tasting notes out when it's ready to be tasted, not when we're ready for it to be tasted. How this translates to you as the YouTube viewer is you follow along with the recipe, you do all the practices just like you saw in the video, and you drink it after a month, and you're wondering why it tastes like garbage and blaming yourself, when in reality, you may just need to put it in a dark space for another couple of months and wait, and it might taste great by then. Patience is fine in home brewing, and as practices have improved, we've been able to speed the process along, but Sometimes it's okay to just wait. Don't rush to consume. All right, friendos, that is our top 10 mistakes you've learned from YouTube. Is there something else that you've seen on another channel or our channel that you take issue with? Throw that down in the comments. We'd love to see what you have to say. You can follow us on Instagram and Pinterest at doing the most okay. Our website is doingthemost.org. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button so you can see more content like this. Thanks to everyone for watching and we'll see you next time.